All right, let's. Uh, I want to start this out with some interactive, you know, icebreakers. So, uh, can I have anyone raise their hand if they've worked with GDPR before? Okay, a lot of you. Keep your hands up. Uh, keep it up if you've worked with CCPA. How about uh, CPRA? If you know what it is, or CPA, or. UCPA? All right, no hands anymore. All right, so these are the things we're going to talk about today. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be here with, with you all and, and talk about marketing needs privacy. Uh, I'm going to save some time at the end for questions, make sure we have time to do an interactive conversation about anything that we talk about. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and, and dive right in. Uh, my name is John Doyle, uh, president and founder of Digital Polygon. Uh, and the first iteration of this uh, deck was built in collaboration with Rick Buck. Uh, he's the chief privacy officer at Wirewheel, uh, their privacy uh, company, product company. Um, and uh, our information is here and, and will be in a slide deck as well. Uh, he couldn't be here today, but still want to give him a call out for this. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, there's really three key buckets I want to I want to talk to you guys about. The first is understanding the current privacy landscape in the United States. Um, it's changing really fast and it's going to go into effect uh, starting early next year uh, with enforcement being applied. And it's really important that we as web and marketing teams start to understand what's coming so that we can prepare and maybe have these conversations. Otherwise, what happened with GDPR is going to happen and legal is going to come to us two weeks before enforcement happens and say, why isn't this done? Get this done. Right. So, you know, I want to start preparing people for what's coming and, and how we can uh, think about this from a website perspective and interact with, uh, with these other teams that we have. The second is industry movement. So talking about um, big industry and how they're responding to privacy. Uh, this is more just to reinforce that uh, privacy is here to stay. It's not going to change. It's become a part of our daily lives, uh, which I personally think is a good thing as an individual. Uh, it's a really hard thing as a marketer and as a business owner as our life is going to change uh, over the next couple of years if it hasn't already. Uh, and then lastly, I'll talk about how privacy and your website need to interact so that we can frame the conversation we have uh, with the different members of our teams, our legal teams, our privacy teams, uh, and our downstream vendors, uh, even depending on what we're doing. And then I'll leave you with some useful tools and Drupal modules and things that uh, could help you in this process. And we'll open up for Q&A at the end. So jumping right in, uh, this is the IEPP's state legislation tracker. Uh, this is a, a great resource available on the IEPP website that kind of gives you a high level view of the United States, uh, what bills are in progress, which ones failed, which ones were approved. Uh, and at a high level, uh, 33 states have introduced 62 bills as of about two weeks ago. Uh, this was updated uh, on the 7th, April 7th, for IEPP's big conference they had in D.C. about two weeks ago. Um, five have passed uh, through four states. So California has two laws. Uh, Colorado, Virginia, and Utah have all passed in, in the last six to 12 months. Uh, Utah being the most recent, just passed uh, earlier this year. And there's 29 bills that have died and 28 bills that are still up for some state of discussion. Uh, in addition to this, you know, GDPR is a big one that everyone knows about, but China passed PIPL, um, Australia passed the Federal Privacy Act, Brazil uh, passed LGPD, and more and more countries are starting to uh, jump into this. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I'm assuming both have agreed on some of these, but I haven't followed the federal side of things. Um, it looks like more liberal states when I look at the, the, the chart here, but um, something to definitely dig a bit deeper on. Yep. Um, another view that they have at the IEPP is the U.S. State Privacy Legislation Tracker. Uh, this gives you a list of every bill that's gone uh, to committee. Um, and uh, it really gives you an idea, a high-level view of what uh, each bill includes. And you, It's not meant for you to read. I'll go into a little bit more detail. 
but this breaks it into two sets of rights. You have consumer rights, uh, which is what consumers have the right to do when they come to your organization, to your business, and then you've got your business obligations. So this is uh, what are you obligated to do as a business to protect your users. And we'll get into this uh, a little bit. I'm not going to dive deep into laws uh, for, this, for this presentation, um, but uh, you can see here in the, in the list uh, some of the different rights that people have. And we'll focus more on the web side of things uh, and, and how our website has to support these uh, rather than going into too many details here. But if we break this down to the laws that have passed, uh, we can see uh, CCPA, CPRA, CDPA, um, CPA, and UCPA, uh, or the five, uh, with the states. And you can see that there is some consistency here, which is great for us as implementers of uh, these privacy laws, but there's also a lot of differences that we need to take into account. Um, if you've looked at any big sites recently, you'll notice that there's always a California resident policy at the bottom. There's a do not sell button now. And these all came out of CCPA. CPRA is gonna extend California's uh, enforcement and laws. And Virginia and Colorado kind of built off of CPRA. So those are somewhat consistent, but they're still gonna have one-offs everywhere. Go ahead. Sure, I can, I can do my best. Uh, CCPA is California Consumer Protection Act, Privacy Act. CPRA is Cal California Privacy uh, Rights Act, I believe. Uh, CDPA is Consumer Data Protection Act. Uh, CPA is, is Consumer Protection Act or Privacy Act. And then UCPA is Utah Consumer Privacy Act. Um, and if I got any of those wrong, uh, they are on this slide in more detail. So uh, I can send you a link to the tracker afterwards. Um, and the, the biggest difference here that we're going to uh, notice is that Utah, which just passed, is way more business friendly uh, than the other three laws. And it has less, less user rights that you have to comply with. And that's going to make our jobs even more uh, confusing as we go into a web and marketing implementation that now I have to deal with different, not just by country, different laws, but by state. And how do I track this? How do I know where you're coming from? How do I know you're a California resident if you're on an IP address in Maryland? And uh, this, this, these are some of the challenges that we have uh, as web and marketing teams to, to look forward to here uh, coming shortly. Um, Privacy changes are moving fast. Like I said, uh, last year we started with CCPA. Now we've got uh, another four laws that have passed. And there's two more that are uh, in cross committee, which is uh, uh, which are looking like they'll get passed here in the next six months. Things could change, of course. And uh, what I'm looking forward to at some point is a federal privacy uh, implementation because that should help standardize this. Um, but I, I don't personally see that happening this year, um, maybe next year, um, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, and, you know, the IPP resources are a great place to, uh, to look for that. So when we look at September 2021 to April 2022, we take the same graph and you can see that the color coding is extremely different. Uh, this is how fast bills are introduced or killed and move forward. Um, and... I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these slides. I just uh, kind of want you to see uh, how fast this landscape is moving just in the last six months. Um, you can see how different the sizes of these charts are. Uh, just in the last six months, we've had more than double uh, the bills go into a cross committee or above uh, with new states throwing laws up uh, basically every other week. And uh, a lot have also died in uh, committee or, or somewhere through the process. Um, and you can look at what these laws included in this table uh, in more detail if you're interested in getting, uh, getting more details on it. Right, so one really important part of this is when do these go into effect? So these laws were passed in the last two years and now we need to look at, okay, when does enforcement begin? Because that's really what our timeline is as web teams and marketing teams to implement these changes. Um, the answer is January 1st, 2023. Uh, California Privacy Rights Act uh, and Virginia's Consumer Protection Act go into effect uh, on January 1st, 2023. Some of the guidelines for enforcement aren't even out yet. Um, 
Uh, last I heard, we're expecting those sometime in September. So that's likely when you know your legal teams are going to start pinging you. And if you haven't done any prep work, then your Q4 is going to be uh, probably a little hectic if you have to comply with these laws. Um, Colorado Privacy Act is going to be July 1st, 2023. And then Utah is going to be the end of 2023 and December 31st. So this is kind of what the timelines are looking like. We'll see when new bills get passed, how they add them in and how much runway you have. Um, but uh, this, is, this is kind of what we're working towards here with, with most of our clients. Um, and on, on the privacy law side, you know, privacy is here to stay. There's more international laws. There's more U.S. laws. This isn't going to, you know, we're not going to wake up tomorrow. This isn't going away. So we need to start preparing for it as uh, web and marketing teams. And we need to start building foundations for uh, being able to support this. Um, and the new laws closely resemble GDPR, uh, but everything in the U.S. Uh, from a marketing side is opt out. Uh, whereas everything in GDPR is opt-in. So there are differences here in how you have to act uh, with these different laws. And that means that you know your marketing team uh, or your sales team is definitely not going to want you to throw a GDPR cookie banner on your site, uh, stop tracking everything if they don't have to. So now we have to get way more granular with how we implement these solutions, how we target users in different locales, um, and how we work with uh, our downstream vendors as well. Um, so with that, uh, I want to shift a little bit over to uh, the marketing side and the tools that we use. And I really love this quote by Tim O'Reilly because it's who has the data has the power, right? We have the data that we use to personalize people's experiences, to give them a better user experience, to inform decision making, and uh, to really uh, improve our products or features we use this data for, for tons of different things. Um, it, it's, it's our responsibility uh, now to be responsible for that data. Uh, a lot of times as marketing teams, we're using tools that we have no idea what else they do with that data. We're not reading through the 60 page contracts to say, how else are they using the data that I collect when I put this marketing pixel on my site or this heat map on my site? And these are the things that these laws are starting to push and, and protect. And, um, you know, it really is up to us and up to these vendors to start um, taking responsibility for this data we have to protect it and, and to really uh, respect our users' rights uh, to their data. So with that, let's look at how the industry has started protecting uh, their data in, in the marketplace. And I like to show this because it'll, it'll give you a good idea of how much privacy is impacting business and if all of the big guys are doing it, it's definitely going to trickle down to the rest of us, right? And it's going to impact what we do. So the first thing I like to talk about is the rise of privacy browsers. Um, you know, they still don't have uh, amazing market shares. They're not going to overtake Google tomorrow, um, but they do exist and they are being used. And uh, a lot of the reason that you can't see how much share they're taking is because they actually block giving you access to what browser they're using. Um, right, privacy first uh, is what Brave and DuckDuckGo do, and uh, this is already going to start impacting your ability to market um, as more and more people uh, start using these tools. Um, one thing that I, I pulled from IAPP last week, this isn't even out yet, but Google, uh, probably the best release I've seen around privacy for Google is putting out this privacy guide. and. Uh, Google Chrome has a lot of privacy features uh, in the tool, but this is the first time they've provided a nice user experience to guide people through how to use that. Um, so this is gonna start impacting our ability as marketers, third-party cookies and other things like that because it's gonna allow users to more easily go and manage their settings in Chrome. Uh, third-party cookies are going away. Obviously, this has been in the news all over the place for Chrome. Uh, they pushed it back to 2023. Uh, but it's still in the roadmap, it's going to disappear, uh, something we need to be aware of and start looking at different tech stacks to deal with. Uh, the end of Google Analytics 3, uh, this is again pushed to July of 2023. Uh, if you're not on GA4 yet, uh, it's probably time to start looking so you have data. Um, the collection will stop in July of 2023. They won't delete your data for six months is what they're saying right now. 
but you can run GA3 and GA4 at the same time right now, so there's really no harm in you starting to get GA4 set up now while you start to learn to use it. Um, if you have played around with it, you'll know it's a bit different than GA3. It's not just plug and play, so you, you want to prep for this uh, well ahead of time. And Apple is one I love to talk about. Uh, Tim Cook actually keynoted IAPP uh, two weeks ago. And uh, some of their privacy features here, if you've seen the headlines, are costing Facebook, what, $12 billion is what they just said. Uh, so these are going to continue to uh, impact our ability to do business. Um, so uh, mailing privacy protection. So if you sign up for uh, an app on your phone, if you have an Apple phone, it'll now actually put in a fake email address that proxies back to your real email address. So Google, I mean, uh, Apple is the only one with your actual personal email. And when you sign up, it, it uses fake emails so that if anyone else has a data breach, you're not impacted in that way. Um, and uh, sorry, that was the hide my email. The mail privacy protection, if you use uh, Apple Mail, it'll actually remove all the tracking pixels from your emails. So I don't know how many people here are marketers or salespeople that have tracking on their emails where you can see when people open it and see uh, click-through rates and open rates, but uh, Apple's mail system actually blocks these so that people can't track what you're doing in it. Um, and you have to use their app for this to work, but um, that's really going to impact our ability to, to calculate metrics, to uh, you know, figure out if our campaigns are working or not, and uh, you know, these are the things that are coming. And Safari, of course, has been blocking third-party cookies by default since 2020. Chrome is going to catch up next year, uh, but these are definitely important things for us to think about and us to um, start adapting to. Um, and hopefully it gives you an idea that, again, this privacy thing is not going to go away. It's just going to continue to, to impact us, and if we don't change, uh, we're going to be left behind. Right, so we talked about kind of the current privacy landscape in the United States, we talked about some industry movement. Now let's talk about how this impacts us and how we should start thinking about this as website owners and marketers uh, on our websites. Uh, I like to break this down into three simple buckets. Uh, really with all of these laws from a website perspective, we need to provide information to users. This is telling people what we do with their data. Um, you probably already have privacy policies, you have in there uh, what cookies do we use? What information do we collect? How do we process that information? Um, some of these laws go beyond that. What are my rights as a California uh, resident? Um, that's what providing information is all about. The second bucket is facilitating requests. So as part of these laws, uh, I as an individual, if I was in California, have the right to request access to my data that you have, to delete that data, um, to rectify my data. Uh, there's some portability laws in there. Um, so you as website owners, especially now that COVID is here, your website is really the place where people interact with your brand. No one's picking up a phone and calling you. Most sites like organizations don't even have phone numbers to call for this. So you need a way on your website to facilitate these requests. It can be as simple as an email in your privacy statements, can be as complex as a fully automated form that sends tickets down to your downstream systems. Um, but uh, your website really needs to support that. And then managing consent is the last one. So this is do not sell, cookie compliance, um, do not sell my information, and uh, there's a automated decision-making consent in there too. Um, so uh, these are the things that you need to provide your users with. If we take a look at it as more of a logical diagram here, um, we're not going to talk about email and social too much today, although that is likely part of your stack, but your website sits on top of all of these tools that collect data, that you pass data through, um, and that you interact with on a normal basis. And a lot of these laws are going to require you to take those preferences that users set and make sure that all of your downstream systems respect them. Um, there's also this idea of being able to keep a log of when a user opted in or opted out so that you have this uh, audit log so that when some lawyer comes and tries to sue you for this information because this user opted out, uh, I, I say, well, we have it here that they did or we have it here that they didn't and, and what went wrong and what went right. 
So something to think about um, uh, as we're managing these consents and collecting this consent is how do we prove it? Um, so I won't go into more detail on all of these uh, for here, but I do want to actually look at some examples of uh, websites that do a good job uh, of providing this information and um, really big industry has already started complying with the laws that are out there and are good places to look for examples if, if you need some inspiration. Uh, this privacy and security center is uh, actually Home Depot. I think they did a really good, good job of breaking out their information. They've got tables for displaying what cookies they use grouped by category uh, and what they do with each type of this cookie um, and how they process that data, who they share it with. And uh, this is about saying what you do. If you're open and honest about what you do with the data, you should be fine. Um, one thing to note is you are going to change what you do with your data as new tools come on, as new products come on, as new processes open. So this isn't a set it once and forget it. This is, I need to build a process around this with my team so we're interacting on a, a regular basis. Uh, to keep this up to date and keep it relevant. Uh, and that's, again, probably going to fall on the marketing teams because they own the websites, um, not something that we, we typically do right now. Facilitating requests. Uh, this is an example of a, a DSAR form uh, in the industry. It's uh, uh, data subject access requests is a lot of what this uh, realm is called. Um, so delete, access, rectification, portability. There's some opt-out category access requirements under CCPA here. Um, and uh, there are tools and vendors out there to support you uh, if you want to automate these DSARs. Um, but I've seen plenty of organizations just provide email addresses and run it through a manual process behind the scenes. Um, large organizations, I believe they passed a law last year, a requirement that um, they have to actually publicly post how many DSARs they got, how fast they were turned around in and how many they approved or rejected and make that publicly available to everyone. So you can actually see uh, how fast they're turning these things around and it's taking for them to execute these requests. And we'll see more automation come in and into the market as, as things pick up here. Um, and lastly, managing consent. Um, again, these are cookie notices. These are do not sell uh, opt outs. And uh, one thing that I thought was pretty cool is this global privacy control. Uh, we'll talk about it more here in a minute, uh, but uh, this global privacy control is a open standard that they're trying to push in the United States to say, um, I've chosen to opt out of do not sell and way for the rest of uh, companies to respect that. Right now, it's very granular. It's all browser based and uh, there's no way for you to universally opt out unless someone respects something like this. So if I go to one website and opt out there, I go to another website, I have to opt out there. If I get, open a new browser or my phone, it's all very manual and, and segregated. Um, so finding a way to centralize this and uh, allow users to choose uh, is what this is going after. Uh, how many companies actually pick it up because it hurts their ability to market? We'll, we'll see. Um, but it's out there and it's definitely worth taking a look at. Uh, and with that, uh, there are tools to help you. Um, Drupal modules, uh, open source enables everyone. So uh, I couldn't come to DrupalCon without pointing out some Drupal modules that were here. Um, cookies, consent management, and GDPR are two good ones to get you started. Um, you will see disclaimers on all of these modules that say, installing my module does not make you compliant. Um, this is something that a lot of teams don't fully understand. Um, just by installing a tool and putting a banner up doesn't mean I'm compliant with these laws. Um, and this goes for a lot of like third-party consent management tools too. If I've got a tool that enables consent, but if I don't hook that up to my tag manager or use their tag blocking scripts or something like that, I'm not actually compliant. Clicking that button does nothing. Um, so I've seen a number of implementations that, that have kind of fallen off the rails because of that. Uh, so it's important to understand uh, a little bit deeper about what this tool is doing for you and what you need to do yourself. Um, and there's a number of vendors that can help you. A lot of these vendors have Drupal modules to integrate their third-party products to help you. Uh, of course, Wirewheel is, is uh, a great one. Um, they should have uh, their Drupal module out uh, 
think less next week, hopefully. Um, so uh, we're, we're creating that for them and we should get it out. User centrics and consent manager.net are two cookie consent uh, tools. And all the big cookie consent tools have GDPR and then they have additional versions for CCPA um, and they'll have the other laws being added as they go into enforcement. And they'll, they're taking care of a lot of the geolocation and the different uh, nuances of each law. So that can help you really get uh, some, some speed uh, out of their tools if, if you choose to go with a third party to support you. Um, but you can do it yourself if you have a team willing to do that. Um, again, the GPC, I won't talk about this too much more, but there are also Chrome extensions for DuckDuckGo, for example. I don't know how many of you use that, but it'll block marketing scripts, it'll enable GPC, um, and the first time I heard about it was this tweet from uh, the old attorney general from California. Um, and like I said, it's not at a mainstream level of adoption yet, uh, but I think uh, anything that sets a standard that we can comply with, so there's not 5,000 different ways to do it, uh, is a good thing in my book. So I uh, highly recommend taking a look at it. And then uh, I couldn't leave without talking about the DAA. Uh, the your, your ad choices. If you go to privacy policies uh, around the U.S., you'll see um, links to your ad choices in almost all of them. There's not a great way for you to tell downstream vendors to change the way you adapt information, and uh, this is kind of how it's done right now. So there's about 126 supporting organizations in the DAA, and if you click on the link, you go there. Uh, It'll give you a list of all those. It's like Facebook, Google, et cetera. You can check out which ones you don't want to retarget you and automate decision-making for you and save it. And that sets uh, some cookies on your browser that should limit the way that they use your data. You as a marketing team can't really control this. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting thing that's gonna continue to happen over the next couple of years, I think, uh, with uh, vendors, Supporting this or not, Facebook released LDU, uh, limited data use, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, to allow you to, to flip a switch on how this user is being retargeted to for ads with Facebook. Um, but it, it's all over the map right now. And uh, for the your ad choices, I go on my phone, I go on a different browser, I clear my cookies, it all resets. Um, so it's, it's just something that us as consumers, if we're gonna do this, need to understand. Um, and like I said, it's a pretty complicated market here. Um, Google consent mode uh, is primarily targeted at the US. If you've done GDPR, you're probably familiar with the TCF 2.0 framework. Uh, Google's products are already compliant with that framework. Um, but if you're not implementing GDPR and you need to implement a consent mode, um, Google's consent mode is a good one to set up with Tag Manager. Uh, and it'll, it'll pass uh, this data through to uh, the Google products to change how uh, the consent status pings for Google ads happen. Uh, it'll change some of the way Google Analytics work with what data it actually collects uh, to make sure that you're respecting this, uh, these policies that uh, are in place for this. So highly recommend taking a look at it if you're not doing GDPR and you need to comply with these laws. It could be a good way to get you started. Um, Right, with that, so key takeaways, uh, I just wanna reinforce that privacy is not a button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's, it's, that doesn't make you compliant. Um, your organization has to be responsible for understanding these laws and what's coming. Uh, are you going to be hit with enforcement? I'm sure there's already law firms lining up for the January 1st enforcement, just like they did with GDPR. Um, so it's important to get ahead of this. Uh, secondly, um, I, I took this from Rick. Uh, if you do what you say and you say what you do, you should be fine. Um, obviously work with your privacy teams and your legal teams to make sure that uh, you've got these things figured out, but uh, it, it pretty much is as clear as that. If you're transparent with the data you collect, you know how your subprocessors are using it, you know what your organization is using it for, uh, and you can say that, and then you can protect that data and choose what you do with it, uh, that it really is as simple as that. Um, and then, you know, ending it with giving users the power to choose. Um, that's really what it comes down to. I, as a consumer, should be able to choose how you use my data, um, just like I do if I walk into your store. 
kind of, but yeah. So, um, all right. So I want to leave you with, with one thought, uh, together we can build a better internet. I truly believe that privacy is, is a new pillar to building, uh, foundational websites, um, right next to accessibility, right next to security. It's, it's our job to protect users' data and their rights. And I think if we do it together, uh, the internet will become a better place. Um, I'll leave you with slides um, with some resources to those IAPP diagrams I had. Uh, also, Wireless Privacy Law Comparison Table. Um, they have a interactive table that has all the different privacy laws and a lot of information comparing them. So if you're interested in digging a little bit deeper, uh, it's a really good resource for that. And with that, thank you all for coming and I'll open up to questions and we can keep talking. Sure. So why wouldn't I just take the most stringent standard like you do and implement that? So the question was why wouldn't I just take the most stringent standard and implement with that? The answer is probably because your sales and marketing teams would get really, really mad at you. Um, you know, I, I, if we're being good stewards and doing privacy first, it's a way to do it. But when you're talking about business and you're talking about revenue, because it has direct impacts, uh, it becomes a much harder conversation within your organization. And then to, to make my marketing people happy, do I have to implement policies for Virginia customers and then for California customers and then for European customers? That is what I'm seeing around the market, yes. It's a different policy for every place and we're doing as little as we have to, to be compliant with the laws. Um, hopefully that changes with the federal regulation and we can be more consistent, but um, it, we're just not there yet. So it's really up to your organization how you want to interact with this, how do you want to get ahead of it. And you know, if you think about uh, first party data versus third party data, um, maybe you have some more power if, if we go away from the third party data tools um, that you can build trust with your users and, and gain that consent back. Yep. 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 So that example uh, for the DSAR forms was actually an example of wire wheels. Um, uh, it was their DSAR product. And uh, yeah, if you take a look at their website, they've got demos and interactive content for that. I, I could probably send you a link of a few sites afterwards. Okay. Sure. Yep. So in these materials as you fully explain them, um, are there any like did you think you can actually draft more instructional documentation to kind of bridge that gap between the two? All right. So the question was, uh, there needs to be a connection between legal and marketing teams and is Google or anyone else gonna put information out to help facilitate that? Uh, I doubt Google will, um, but I think a lot of these uh, privacy uh, product companies and privacy management consulting companies uh, will help you do that. And with the business obligations, there's also privacy impact assessments and uh, things that organizations are forced to do, um, which uh, they also help with. And that's, that's about mapping your data and uh, doing assessment of how you're storing personal data and how much risk is associated with that, uh, that you're required to do under some of these new laws. Sure. So you talked about in the marketplace how things are being tailored for the different states and the regulations. Yep. How do you deal with, and I'm assuming some of the businesses that may have a, a presence in certain states, so a place like uh, Virginia, where there are uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people every day either in the DC or in Maryland. Yep. So they're, they're using a computer that's exactly addressed to everyone where they live. Yep. What level of regulation? Like, what do you, what can you tell them about that? Yeah, so the question was, uh, how do we comply with these laws with users who, like, how do we tell where they live? If I'm a Virginia resident or a California resident, but I'm in a different state or a different IP at work, how do I uh, make that decision? And uh, the answer is, I don't have a good one. Um, you know, in your, on your websites, you'll see, like, 
uh, statements at the bottom of the website for if you're a California resident, you get these benefits, you can execute these. So for DSAR processes, uh, a lot of the automation frameworks for validating this user is who they say they are, which you need to do if you're going to give someone access to all the information on them. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, KYN validation processes. You have to upload like your ID or things like that to validate you are uh, actually who you say you are. Um, so that's one piece of it. For actual do not sell consent, um, I haven't really seen good enforcement uh, parameters on that. Uh, a lot of people are geotargeting uh, California, but again, it doesn't capture everything. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer on that. It's, it's really up to your legal team on how uh, they want to control that and how much worse they're willing to accept. And do we just allow anyone that wants to click do not sell to be enforced or not? Um, or, you know, is it only if you're in California not using a VPN, uh, you know, it's, it's a legal decision in, in my mind based on risk. Does that answer your question? No. Okay. Anyone else? No? All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate it.